Welcome back there, boys and girls. It's time for a little bit of flip class uh, PowerPoint lecture. That's right, it's time to watch a lecture about how you should be uh, doing lectures. Uh, go with me, it's important. The reason why we need to discuss this is because note taking is one of the most crucial skills that you can learn in school. Not only is it going to help you uh, with this class and every other class, it will help you with uh, all your rest of your years in high school, it will help you with your years beyond high school, and I know that's something that at least most of you are concerned with, because even if you wanna do a non-college job, like you're, you're looking at tech school, some kind of technical uh, skilled trade, you're still gonna have to sit through like lame PowerPoint presentations and you're gonna be expected to remember the things that they tell you in that presentation. So these note taking skills are going to help you be ready for any test worth taking. Not just paper and pencil test, not just weird online uh, edge elastic test, but any test of those skills, including, but not limited to, doing them. Let's talk about why you need to take notes the science class, so I feel like it's a good opportunity. Talk about some science. The studies have found you will remember things better if you take notes. Additionally, just listening like, oh, I'm an auditory learner, I'm gonna listen. Studies have found that most people, myself included, who uh, are like one of those auditory learners, we're only going to be able to recite about 50% of what we have heard. Usually, when we're reciting that 50%, up to 30% of it is what is correct. So you take 30% times 50%, now you're only accurately able to recall about 15% of what you heard. What's a 15%? Oh, that's like an F minus minus, so we don't want that score on a test, okay? The way that this works is, even though it seems like all your memory is just memory, you actually have different types of memory. So let's talk about some of those different types of memory. There is working memory. This is stuff like uh, you put down your mouse and then you need to remember where your mouse is. After not very long, you're not gonna have where that mouse is anymore. If you don't actively think about it, like where's the pencil at, these are things that you're, you're currently working on. Normally, uh, in school, we try to minimize what is called the cognitive load. That's the amount of things that you're trying to juggle in your working memory, because working memory really can only reliably hold about five to seven things. So, you know, what kind of mood are you in? What did the teacher just say? Did that person just flash me the eyes because I think they're kind of cute? Those are things that could be taking up your working memory. Then you have short-term memory. These are things that you have actively tried to remember. For example, uh, where did I set my phone down when I went into my friend's house? Where did I park the car? That would be something that goes in the short-term memory. You're gonna remember it for a little bit, but 30, 40 minutes later, it's getting a little fuzzy. Next day, probably gonna be gone. Short term, just for short term. Long term memory, uh, like it says, is for long term. What's really interesting is the studies have found long term memory is permanent. You do not forget things that you have encoded in your long term memory. Anytime someone's like, oh, I can't think of blah, 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 oh, I forgot it. No, they didn't. You don't forget things in your long term memory. What's he even talking about? There's no way you remember everything you've ever learned, long-term memory, forever. No, for real though, long-term memory actually is, once it's encoded, in there forever. I know, not everybody remembers things, and sometimes you'll have some stuff that you are pretty confident you did encode, long-term memory should be there forever, and then all of a sudden, it's not. What's the deal with that? Well, while it the current understanding of memory does say that once you have something memorized, once you have it in your long-term memory, it is there forever. However, the connections between those two things might, uh, they might break down over time. So everything will be encoded in your long-term memory, you just might not be able to access it in the same ways that you used to. This is one of the reasons why uh, we refer to uh, a lot of processes as use it or lose it. You need to continuously practice this so that you're reinforcing the connections you've made in your memory so that you don't forget things. And by forget, I mean just lose the connection. It's still in there, which is why sometimes ideas will just pop into your head later. 
Most of the stuff that you forgot, those are things that never made it out of your short-term memory and actually got properly encoded in the long-term memory. Encoding is the process of converting short-term memory into long-term memory. Rehearsal is the mechanism of encoding. Now, you should understand that what a psychologist calls rehearsal, we call stupid, lame drill and horrific, horrific repetition. If you're a music person, this is like practice, all right? If you're a sports person, it isn't like all of practice, just the least fun part of practice. For example, you're playing basketball. This is when you're doing foul shots over and over and over and over for hours and hours and hours and hours. Baseball, this is where you're throwing the ball at the target, just you and the bounce back net target for hours over and over and over and over and over. Do you hear the pattern over and over and over and over and over? Rehearsal is what gets things into your long-term memory. Without that, you are going to forget them because you are not actually remembering them in the first place. In school, rather than rehearsal or practice, we call this process studying. Wait, I thought we were talking about notes and stuff. We are. The important part with notes is that we wanna make something useful to do rehearsal so that you can encode short-term memory from class into long-term memory. The purpose of good notes is to remember exactly what happened in class. Part of the problem is actually on the teacher's end because you're used to having over PowerPoints where basically everything is spelled out in the form of many words as possible and then all those words usually get read to you. Many students have a habit of simply copying down everywhere written on the board or displayed in a presentation. It's not a good system for taking notes. It has two major flaws. Some of you taking notes, you probably wrote all that down already. Now, come on. First and foremost, there's, there's no way you could keep up with that. As fast as I was just reading, you can't write that fast. No one can write as fast as you can hear. On average, we hear about 100 times faster than we can write with our hands. Don't even get me started on typing, because even the fastest typers can't keep up with that. That's the reason why, like a court stenographer, they have a weird little keyboard where they're not typing words. They've got buttons that do entire words in a crazy form of shorthand that they actually have to go to school to learn just to be able to keep up by writing down what they are able to hear. The other major problem is a lot of times you just go on autopilot. Well, it appeared on the screen, so I must write it down. You'll write down like jokes, things you already know, things you've already written down already in your notes. I know, we're talking about rehearsal, but when you're in the middle of note taking, that is not the time to rehearse. You're already rehearsing once by hearing it, thinking about it, and writing it. The rest of the rehearsal should come later. You wanna use a good system of notes because you need to not write down things that you just wrote five minutes ago. You need to just write down enough that you can use your notes as a tool to study later. That's right, your notes are a tool to study later. By the way, here are some things I've seen students write down. Anyone that doesn't know this, I'm very confused about how, you, how it is that you are even able to understand the words coming out of my mouth right now. In a biology class, I saw a bunch of freshmen in high school writing this down. Oh, cells are important. Oh, it's on the screen. Cells. Of course they're important. They're what you're made out of. Do you need to write that down? Are you, are you at risk of forgetting that cells are important? I don't think so. No reason to write down things you already know. Uh, this one right here, I was in a college course, College United course, and uh, day one, I watched one of my classmates, junior in college, pre-med, writing this down. There's no reason to write this down. First off, uh, that's obviously the professor's opinion. You could make some good arguments for uh, genetics being very important. However, again, do you need help remembering this later? There's no reason to write that down. Here are some good ideas for some good ways to make your notes better. First and foremost, you should date your notes. Not like, you know, take them out to dinner, try to get them to go to you with homecoming, and number the pages. This way, if like stuff gets all out of order, you know how to put it back into order. You don't have to try and remember like, am I on page 20 or 21 of notes? Because you're just gonna be able to keep track of the numbers for the pages of notes you're taking in class that day if you put the date at the top. The reason why many of your teachers, the first thing when they give you the notes, they're like, all right, put your name and the date at the top. That's for you, not for us. That's for you, so do it. The other thing when you're taking notes, you wanna be as brief as possible. Luckily, 
You all know how to text. You all know how to abbreviate the crap out of things. You have your own weird text speak shorthand that most of y'all parents can't even understand. Use that in your handwritten notes. Not when you answer a question that the teacher asks you, but use it in your handwritten notes. Sure. For example, you could use this for assignment, uh, depending on what class you're in. Could be protection, could be proteins, could be Protestants. Maybe you're in a history class, talking about like the Reformation in England, stuff like that. The other thing you want to do and this is why you don't want to just copy off a of PowerPoint, is you want to try to group those ideas together. So later on in the lecture, if the teacher circles back to some concept that you're writing up here, you want to leave room up here where you could write that concept with the rest of that concept. One of the great systems for doing that, and I know some of you have heard of this one, is called the Cornell style of notes. Basically, you take your whole piece of paper, there it is, all nice and beautiful, and you normally your margin's like here, right? At like the one inch, maybe one and a quarter. You take that sucker to like two and a half inches. So you're writing with about six inches. How much is two and a half inches on a piece of paper? That's like three-ish three or four fingers, okay? So if plop down three of your fingers on the paper, boom, make a big line, make that margin bigger, all right? Three, four fingers, make it bigger. Use the majority of your space for recording your notes here. PS is what we call the five R systems. You got record, reduce, recite, reflect, revise. Record is gonna go here. Over here, this is where you could do uh, reducing, right? You can take this big gobbledygook later outside of class, you can condense it into smaller, meaningful, easily digestible points. This is also where you could do some reciting, basically reading your notes to you or rewriting the notes to yourself if you're like in study hall and you're not supposed to be talking to each other. You could also review and reflect. This is where you could like interact with the notes, write some of your opinions. Like, is it really that way? Huh, that seems weird. This would also be a great place over here to jot down like any of the key terms. So you got some notes over here, Key terms that you'll want to drill later could go here. Anytime your, uh, your instructor gets really like excited about something, you can write it down over here like, oh, Mr. P went crazy about this part. Because usually if your teacher is excited about it, it's going to show up on the test. This right here is a great tool that will help you have notes that will allow you to use them later for rehearsal to encode the short-term memories that you took from lecture that day into long-term memory that you will remember for life. Here's some of the things you want to avoid, though. Don't just try and listen for facts, like, like a lot of times in history classes, like names and dates, names and dates, gotta write down these names and dates. But if you don't listen for the overarching concept, you're gonna garble those facts, you're not gonna understand or remember why they were important, and when you're looking at them later, yeah, you might remember that that name goes with that date. What good is that? What does that do for you? What does it even mean? Listen to everything within the context of everything else. Shoot for main ideas. When you're trying to write things down, shoot for main ideas. We've got Google. You can look up the facts if you need to. You want the main ideas. The reason why uh, you can't just sit down at Google and watch everything like scroll through Reddit, for example, is you need someone to put this stuff in context. You need someone to give you the main ideas. Teachers are specifically trained to do that for you. Don't try to outline everything. In this PowerPoint, you can see that we've got sort of an outline pattern, but this isn't really an outline. In addition to that, not all your instructors are going to be using, not all your teachers are going to be using outline format. It's just outlining bullet points is great for making lists, is great for a plan of attack for a paper that you have to write, like for English or history class. It's not flexible enough for a note-taking system. Try not to write in full sentences. Obviously, uh, you know, speed is important. Abbreviations are important. Don't use up all the space because you might need to add something later during that lecture. And again, the, the Cornell system gives you that nice big chunk on the side where you've got plenty of room. In addition to that, you want to make sure that you organize your notes. This is, a, this is an actual uh, picture of a student's notebook. Clearly, um, I don't think this kid ever looked inside that notebook because I don't know where to find anything. That paper looks like it's in there sideways. Keeping your notes organized, again, this is useful for you so, because these are a tool that you need to refer to later to help you remember things. So you keep this organized so it's easy to find stuff. This is legit. This was a, a picture actually uh, that I took off of the teacher's desk. Not like I took the picture from a teacher. This was on top of a teacher's desk and I snapped a picture of it so that you can see that adults don't always do this the best either. This is one of the reasons for this class why I recommend you having a nice, big, hefty three-ring binder to help you organize your notes, your papers, your documents. 
This year, uh, the corona is gonna be a little weird because we're doing everything virtually as much as possible, but even then, folders, subfolders, keep your stuff organized. I promise it'll make your life easier. Three ring binders, nice tabbies, like a little table of contents so you can leaf through. This is what we wanna shoot for. There's a lecture on how to take notes. If you have any questions, be ready. Uh, we're gonna discuss some of this next time we see each other in class. Thank you as always for watching.